this is how you come down. really screwing up a lot of things for a lot of people how long was that maybe due to traffic going so slow although I did pass everybody eventually but <laughs> it's unfortunate when you get on those gravel roads that are like your backyard and these people are doing 20 kilometers an hour lines of them it's like oh my god this isn't happening already it's gonna take took around four hours to get home after traveling one and a half Two and a half, three and a half. Yeah, it probably took eight hours to get home altogether with the boat ride. Then I have to finish it off driving behind nervous drivers on gravel road when you normally rip along there doing 80 or 90, right? Anyways, got her done. And I'm back. Now, handful of things I wanted to share and talk about with all you guys. Where's my phone? Hold on a second. Alright, now listen to this. I'm sure if, I'm sure most of you heard about this. If not, you have to hear about this. There's a plane crash in, where is it, Columbia? In the jungle? The adults died and four children lived, survived the plane crash. I know the majority of you must have heard about this. These children were aged 13, 9, 4, and 11 months, and they survived 40 days in the jungle. What? <laughs> Tell me that ain't going to be a new movie coming up, right? 40 days. Apparently the, uh, they had to go get some indigenous trackers. Indi indigenous trackers from the area to come and help try to track these children down. Once they found the wreckage. And because uh, the kids were on the move. One time they found a diaper. Imagine, imagine that. Going to investigate that crash site. You know there's supposed to be, supposed to be some children on it. They're gone. You don't know if they're dead or alive. And you start looking for them. And you start tracking them. And you see that they're on the move. You find a diaper one day. Wouldn't that be absolutely insane? The 13-year-old is a little girl. And I ha I'm not absolutely um, intimate with the details of what went down. But from what I understand is a quick version is she is indigenous. They're all, they're all indigenous to the land. And she knew what to eat and survive on. Imagine, you imagine getting that 11 month old to, to uh, join in on eating that, the food that they were probably gathering, insects, no doubt, lots of fruit. And I did hear from a while, or hear the voice of a wildlife biologist who is familiar with the area, just got back from down there and said that the jungle is absolutely littered with fruit-like items that are actually toxins and poison that would mess you up. And those kids made her. How freaking amazing is that? Unbelievable. Picture that, moms. Picture that one. <laughs> Your 13 year old to 11 month old is out there in the jungle. The search has gone on for a month now. Haven't found your children. You don't know if a jaguar's gobbled them up, crocodiles, snakes, poisonous insects. Wouldn't that? That's just mind frickin' boggling. You know that's gonna be a movie without a doubt. What else? Moving along. Um, Stephen Greer. That went down today. I listened to it live, actually. Thank God I had enough um, internet. I had my earbud in and my phone playing on the way over on the BC Ferry, and I managed to listen to the whole thing. So my take on it, for me, I'll never preach this to anybody, but my gut did not give me any kind of alarm whatsoever. Do I think Greer is solid? From what I can tell, yes I do so far. Yes I do. Unless I've been thrown for a loop. And I'll tell you some of the some of the blatant obvious clues why, simpler ones. 
Number one is when he talked about the advanced technology, he never mentioned that we have to get it before the Chinese or before the Russians or before anybody. There, was, there wasn't even one hint of that in there, politics or military or greed or power, nothing. He seemed to be absolutely sincere in his concern for the world and all of us in creating free energy, which I do. I am familiar with a bunch of the topics that he did mention along the route of the talk today. But that was one strong point for me was it wasn't about a race to get it before anybody else. If it was, that would tell me that he's guilty. It wasn't. He seems to be very sincere. Obviously, he's quite knowledgeable. He's a doctor. Trauma doctor. I think he passed on $12 million a year or some damn thing from his career previous to this until he uh, decided he wanted to do this for mankind. And I believe he's sincere. Do I think all of the items that he brought forward are true? Yes, I do. And a lot of those things he brought forward too, somewhat, a bunch of the points intermeshed up with what people have brought here. And uh, so far, across the board, a lot of people who have allegedly been in contact with these other beings, the one common denominator with that part is, and the question that I've always asked is what's happened to the people, and they have always said consistently, it's us, it's the government. So if you listen to Greer today, you'll hear something said in there that meshes right up, right? With that, although I am certain that there, there have been abductions going that way, without a doubt, David Plattis has, has um, investigated that in depth for a long time. Even like one man who they made a movie about fire in the sky who was abducted, and he gave a very detailed account of being abducted, thrown down on the table, and these um, beings who were not human going at him, right? And there's, a, and there's far, far too many people who have claimed to have been taken up there, that direction, on some kind of a craft by beings that aren't human. So there is that factor that's been thrown down for a long time. It's a strong pattern. Do I believe it? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. You have to listen to each other. We All we, all we have is each other, you guys. And um, I think at this point of the game, I hope one thing that we have all learned here is when someone wants you to shut up, when someone just answers what your question or story is with conspiracy theorist, that should tell us by now who's guilty and who's lying and what's truthful, right? So when some truths come out and they get attacked immediately, red flag for the attackers, right? For me. Anyway, I'm quite tired. I'm, kind of, I'm trying not to babble too much. But anyways, um, I would urge all of you to go to just Google up Stephen Greer on the YouTube. He's got a channel and his live video played live today, so I'd imagine it's still up, right? I'm not certain on the details of the live thing. I know I've threatened to go live a few times myself, haven't had time. But go have, it, go have a listen to it, and then throw down your comments in the comment section below today's video or the next day, or whatever. Just throw down your comments and let us hear what everybody thinks about this. And I guarantee you, it's going to be somebody that is going to try to trash his character without even addressing the information they're sharing. Nothing about the information they're sharing. Nothing about it. All they will do is concentrate on shredding his character. And that's it. And when people do that, red flag for the attacker. Right? Take from what you will or leave it. That's what the honest people say. Take from it what you will or leave it, but make sure you listen for yourself. That's what the honest people say. The people that attempt you to attempt to steer you away from listening to that person are more than likely absolutely guilty, dirty sleazebags. Okay, guys? So, for me, I believe him to be sincere. Um, there has been no secret about how there is energy all around us and it should be free and there should be poverty. I absolutely agree. The evidence has been kicking around now for generations and there have been noted assassinations of scientists and inventors that come up with this numerous times. Also, that's also been related to me, not just for me digging and finding on myself over the years, which I have, but as well as some of the scientists who have contacted me along, along this ride and shared with me what they know about various items. So. 
there you go. That's my call on it. Greer is sincere. I should almost be a t-shirt. Greer is sincere. And, uh, but you need to go watch it for yourself. You need to listen to those powerful testimonies of those people that came on board at the stage with him. And he has a shit pile of other whistleblowers who are scared for their life. A lot of them have been killed. And there's one ex-military man there whose testimony is pretty powerful, quite pretty emotional. And I hope he gets the justice he's seeking as well. But anyway, guys, I don't want to waste too much time on that. Because you need to go listen to it for yourselves and take from it what you will or leave it and let your gut do the deciding for you, not another voice. Don't let me or anybody else decide for you, just your gut. You go with your instincts and get in tune with them, all right? Get in tune with your instincts and go with them and let that decide. All right? Don't go with majority. Don't go with somebody because they press you. Don't, don't go with a decision because somebody's humiliating you. That's all the wrong things to do. Now, I'm going to kick back and relax in here and get some more voices heard because that is very important. Getting the voices, the majority of the population, up to speed with honest facts. And one, that's one thing I can do is I can keep doing that. And uh, I also, did I mention in the other video? I might have chopped it out maybe by accident, but uh, I have started putting together all of my emails from all the scientists in one place to make sense so I can deliver it, just so you guys know. And it's a lot to do. If you follow this channel, you know that I have a lot to do. I don't have, I have little time, but I, I make sure I do this every day. And now I'm going to start chipping away at getting all those emails together and delivering them smoothly to all of you. All right? Just so you know. Now, what do we got? Uh, one more mention. There was... Okay, before I get going, one more mention. There was a large shadow in yesterday's video. And it was it went across the, uh, the, the ground, the bank, where the trees were logged off. Now, that tree line, that slash, that shadow was about... I would say around 650 to 700 yards, meters away from me. <laughs> so um, if you thought that that shadow may have been a bird, you couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> it was a lot larger than that. But there is a popular uh, paraglider jump on the same mountain back in behind me. So I did not hear anything, but I've had those guys before on a different mountain. I had, I was filming one time years ago on the top of a mountain that all of a sudden this crystal clear voice came out right above me. And I looked up and scared the shit out of me and here's this dude hanging in a paraglide thing. I don't know, he might have been 50 yards above me. It was pretty cool, but it was very silent. So, looking at the pattern of that shadow on the ground, I would imagine for certain there was a paraglider up above me. The sun was behind me, projecting that large shadow on the ground, alright? Uh, another mention. So while I was away last night, so I haven't, I just got home today. Last night, Sarah said there was a helicopter right over the house at three in the frickin' morning. She said it was so loud, it sounded like it was landing in the yard. It scared the shit out of her. And I said, "Did you go out and look?" And she's like, "No." So I looked out the out the window, the bedroom window, but I didn't see anything. And I was too scared to go outside. And then. It eventually went away. What's up with that? That's a couple times we've had helicopters low over the river here in the middle of the night, but right over top of the house at 3 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. What the hell's going on, right? So, now I'm home. We'll see if that happens. If it does, we'll be getting some video. For sure. It's a little odd though, right? Alright. There we go. It's enough babble. Let's get into this. The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top secret clearances issued by DONCAF, Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. This is why I've changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story, however, I have known this man, I'll call him Jim, and served in combat with him for many years, and I have and will stake my life on his integrity. 
The only reason I'm telling you this is because you strike me as the same type of no BS kind of guy and people have been misled to believe that these are animals, so it's okay to kill them. Some time ago, Jim was sent on a TAD, Temporary Additional Duty, to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time there was spent on field daying, uh, sorry, most of the time there was spent on field daying this or that location and sitting around passing scuttlebutt, bracket rumors and bracket, about the nature of their purpose there. The official title was simply Security Force. Training was conducted on target acquisition, field navigation, and winter survival. Alert drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert as always, only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode for about 15 or 20 minutes and were ordered to get out. They were in the middle of a huge valley, at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly at first for about a mile and then were told to be quiet. They were also told to check their weapons. Standard M16s, A4s, and one guy had an M40 A3 and 762 by 51 millimeter bolt action rifle. They were told they were there to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmish line and moved forward, slowly and quietly, with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that there was their target. At that point, he and the others cycled the bolts on the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up. Only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear, and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped and it had a long and it had long arms. It turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one, smaller in his words, quote, about maybe four or five feet tall, following the big one. They were quick, too." End quote. The officer in charge hollered, Shoot! And we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arms stand up when he said that. I shit you not. The rest of the story he told me with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it, so we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the downed child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds and she finally went down. No one moved forward, but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, quote, we held our position for, I don't know, about 10 or so more minutes. That's when the officer started to walk towards it. The guide told him to stay there, wait, and give us some time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking. He said, we couldn't even look at each other. My gut was churning the whole time and I wanted to throw up. Finally, the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies, but were ordered back to the truck. On the way back to the compound, he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site, but they weren't from his compound. He said, quote, I don't, I don't, I don't know where they came from. I mean, we were the only military in the area, end quote. Upon returning to the compound, he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired now, and both our wives have passed, so we don't have much to lose. I took a couple of shots of Jack and some other war stories to get to this. Oh, sorry. It took a couple of shots of Jack and some other war stories to get to this one. 
but I swear every word is true. Jim don't lie, and neither do I. And I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be, and I don't care. I just want people to know. I hope you can help make that happen. Feel free to email me if you want any more info. Jim won't talk to you. I try to talk him into it, but he refuses. To tell the truth, I think he's ashamed of what he and the others did. He does agree, though, that people need to know. Thank you, Mike. Mike, I think we've read this before. And if we did, I'm sure there's a lot of people who haven't heard this. And if you're still here, throw down some descriptions, man. Tell us, tell us what you saw. Tell us what was seen, I mean, sorry. Give us some details of what that being looked like. I'm surprised with, if that went down, I'm surprised another one didn't come out and kick your asses. I heard, remember, I don't know who, where did I hear this? It was a recording quite a while ago of a man describing them shooting a, a couple of these from a helicopter. And it was pretty graphic and pretty disturbing what he reported and shared as well. And a big male too. And I think the male stood his ground and they shot the shit out of all of them. Pretty creepy, right? That also relates back to what Greer just mentioned in the live feed video today was the fact that they apparently we have reverse engineered some intelligence, some technology that enables us to take down extra, extraterrestrial craft when they're flying into our atmosphere and thus proving that we are a warring violent species, right? And Greer also was really stressing on how we need to be more peaceful and kind. And that these other entities that these men are aware of claim to be far more emotionally technologi technologically advanced, but stressed on the intelligence, the emotional intelligence. They are far more advanced, and they just want us to be peaceful and embrace peace and kindness. So there you go. You can't really, uh, you can't really argue with that. We are warring violent species, right? We tend to want to kill everything we don't understand and think that it's the enemy. Why is that? You know, why is that? Why do we think we have to kill everything and everything's a threat or a military threat? <laughs> so far, it just seems like we're the only guilty ones, right? Or the worst ones, anyway. I think it's time we all grew up in that department. All right, now, that's quite the story. Let's see if we get any more feedback on that. Okay, here's another one. Steve, now please don't use my name as my employment may be, may be affected. Affected. It was in the late 70s and I was working as a bodyguard to a very influential man. Okay, now I know we read this one. Because I absolutely remember reading that. What's going on? This 2020 is in here. It's not red. That sucks. And here's another one, same thing. All right, I gotta get out of here. Let's get this. All right. Sounds like I've put up the neighbor's lawnmower. It's not too close though. So, okay, Steve, my name is Brian Zylkowski. Zylkowski. So I'm sure listeners will have a crack at calling me a crazy Polak after hearing my encounter, but I'm sure everything I'm about to recount is absolutely true. It happened in the winter of 2018, February, but the exact day eludes me. A registered nurse at the time was working long hours as I have to take on call duties with my job. I worked about 17 or 18 hours and was finally on my way home at about 2 a.m. I was working at a hospital in Mount Clemens, Michigan, and had just exited I-94 Highway at the Woodhams Road exit and was headed north. It's fairly rural. And as you go onto the overpass after exiting the highway, there is a riding stable business to the left and a campground to the right. Shortly past there are several houses and it is not well lit, I will admit. As I was driving, I saw up ahead what I thought must be a horse standing at the edge of the road with front feet actually slightly into the gravel on Wadahams Road. Yes, it was that close to the road. At first, I put two and two together with the riding stable just behind me a ways and thought, son of a bitch, horse must have gotten loose. 
Being an animal lover, I'd figured I'd have to stop and call 911 to get someone out there before it ran into the road and caused an accident, so I slowed down. As I approached, I started to realize it was not a horse. The creature just stood there, and I could see it was looking directly at me, as though it was patiently waiting for me to pass. I soon realized it was a dog. A pure white shepherd type dog. It had a bulky build but a very classic shepherd appearance. It literally, I literally passed by it at about five miles per hour and was within six feet of it as I was in the northbound lane and it was at the edge of the southbound lane with its front paws literally in the gravel and it was actually watching me approach and we literally were staring eye to eye. Its ears were erect and it never gave any indications of menace or aggression. It was as though it saw me coming and decided to just wait for me to pass before it would cross the street. Its front paws were in the gravel at the road's edge and I noticed it was standing right next to a mailbox. The top of its hind quarters were just level with the top of the mailbox. I was in shock. I've had dogs for years. I have three at present and four at the time this happened. I had a friend who used to breed Great Danes and he had one that was an absolute Goliath. This dog I was looking at was a was as tall or taller than that dog, which was actually named Goliath. But this thing was stocky, like a very robust German Shepherd or Husky. My cell phone was in the back seat. I always leave it there so I don't get tempted to respond to texts. I made note of the exact mailbox, which wasn't difficult as there was only three houses and this dog was standing next to the mailbox of the middle house. The next series of houses was a ways down the road. I turned around at the first opportunity, grabbed my phone from the back seat, intent on getting a photo. When I turned around, I saw that it was gone. I stopped in front of the mailbox and surveyed the area, but it was gone. I went back the next day late in the evening and measured the mailbox. It was 48 inches to the top where the dog's butt was level with it. That would put the front shoulders about 6 to 8 inches above that. It was literally the size of a pony or a small horse. I thought about knocking on the door of the house as I expected the owners to come question me as to why I was measuring their mailbox and I thought just maybe they had some mutant dog with pituitary disease. But when no one came out I decided that it would probably just come off as being crazy so I left without questioning the home's owners. Considering that my own wife didn't believe me and said I was seeing things from being overworked I had no reason to think anyone else would believe me. I would estimate the weight of this thing between five and six hundred pounds. Holy shit. Side note, um, a very large wolf here in Canada is 130 pounds, is a very large one. Okay, for reference. I think people often underestimate the weight of cryptids. After my sighting, I began searching the internet for, for world's biggest dogs. The Grand Pyrenees was pretty close to what I saw, but not nearly big enough. Obviously during this searching I came across Dogman and that led me to Bigfoot and I've become fascinated with the topic. But I've noticed people will say they saw a Bigfoot and it was the hugest thing they ever saw. They will state that they didn't think the 44 Magnum they had would do anything but piss it off. They'll say it was 9 to 10 feet tall and 5 feet across and then they'll estimate the weight of 500 pounds. I think to myself Really? So a 500 pound beast is a huge thing you, you ever saw. I think a 44 mag will kill anything weighing under a thousand pounds, no problem. Imagine a one square foot cube. If this one square foot cube weighed one pound, then how much will it weigh if we double the size? Well, a two square foot cube would weigh eight pounds. The volume being length, width, height. So a one foot square cube is one by one by one or one cubic foot. If the cube was made of a substance weighing one pound per cubic foot, this one foot square cube weighs one pound. But merely doubling its dimensions to two foot per side gives two by two by two, or eight cubic feet. So, doubling the dimensions increases the weight eightfold. A six foot tall man of exact same dimensions and consistency as a five foot tall man will, will weigh considerably more. My point is, I think people are often greatly underestimating the weights of these cryptids. When they say the ground literally shook from the steps the cryptid took, 
but then estimate the weight of 500 pounds, it makes you think maybe it's closer to 1,200 pounds. But anyway, back to the story. My home is about three miles from where I saw this thing, and I was really rattled. We live on nine acres of beautiful wooded land. We're out in the country and have deer, turkeys, sandhill cranes, and coyotes all around us. Our woods have well-maintained trails wide enough for my Massimo, Massimo? to drive through them. M-A-S-S-I-M-O. Don't know what that is. And I was really concerned. As I said, the beast I saw never showed aggression. It actually reminded me of a friendly pet dog, and if it had been ten times smaller, it would have felt comfortable trying to pet him or her. But it was massive. I began to carry my 45 Glock when at home. Three nights after my sighting, I came home from work, and my, and my wife said she heard coyotes very close to the house, just beyond a swampy area that borders my property. She said they were making ungodly racket. This had never happened before, and although I often saw canine footprints in my woods, I'd never seen nor heard a coyote on the property. About a month later, my daughter and her boyfriend took the Massimo to ride the trails in our woods and found a dead turkey lying at the entrance to the woods. The turkey was laid out right at the entrance from where my lawn meets the woods right in the center of the trail. The breast meat was removed and it was a very fresh kill. I thought this is strange, but I figured a coyote probably caught a turkey on the trail and managed to kill it, but it seemed to be literally displayed at the trail entrance. The next day my daughter said she had found a large rodent dead laying in the exact same spot as the turkey had been. She said she left it for me to see. I found what I'm guessing was a muskrat laying in the exact location where the turkey had been the day before. It was in rigor mortis when I got to it, but it was fully intact. No sign of anything having been eaten from it. Well now I thought someone was doing this. But the very next day I decided to walk the trails after getting home from work around 5 p.m. What I found at the entrance to the trail still baffles me. We had a pair of sand hill cranes nesting in the middle of the two acre swamp boarding our lawn. I love them. They make the loudest clicking, croating, croaking trumpet sounds every morning. We watched them circle, then land in the center of the swamp every night and felt honored that they chose our property to nest on. Now this swampy area is absolutely impassable. It's spring fed and maybe a couple feet deep in the west area, but the majority of it is just muck and cattails. I've tried walking out into it to get a rain barrel that blew over and rolled down the hill and ended up about 30 feet into the swamp. I sunk six inches with four paces into that muck. There are the underground slings, springs. There are the underground springs that feed this swamp and it stays wet no matter how dry it gets elsewhere. My neighbor told me there's quicksand out there and not to go into it. So, to make it short, you can't traverse the swamp. But what I saw on that third night were four sandhill crane chicks laid out perfectly in a nice neat row. No signs of injury, just dead. In the exact, and I mean the exact same spot as the muskrat the previous night and the turkey the night before. I was now totally creeped out. Do you think? I went and bought a trail cam that night and mounted it facing the trail entrance. For the next three days, nothing. No dead things, no nothing. So I decided to move the camera to another location. I took my three basset hounds and my Glock 30 and headed down the trail. My dogs went into some, some thick brush and wouldn't come out. I fought my way in to get them out and found them chewing on a deer carcass. There wasn't much left but the skeleton and the fur and the legs missing, all flushed down to the hooves. Never found the head though. I found an area of open field about 30 feet from the carcass where the tall grass and weeds were all matted down with blackened blood everywhere. It looked like that was where the kill was made. Stranger, this area is not far from my house. It's literally only about 150 yards away, but you can't see this spot due to the heavy vegetation and trees. But someone should have heard it. Then I remembered the night my wife heard the coyotes. But what was leaving dead things? Not just leaving, but literally displaying them right in the middle of the entrance to the woods. Steve, I'm telling you, these dead animals were displayed. They were left literally right at the entrance where my cut lawn enters the woods. The Sand Hill chicks were laid out in a perfect row with no signs of any injury. No blood, just dead. 
They were all so stiff when I found them. I know this is a bit of a fetch, but I began to wonder, did the beast I saw five or so weeks earlier find me? I did have my window rolled down slightly. I'd do this to help stay awake. If you ever worked back to back 16 hours, 16 hour days, you'd understand. I'd fallen asleep with my eyes open while driving. Could have gotten my scent a month later and found me. I'm only about three miles from where I saw it. Anyway, the story doesn't end there. Our vet actually makes house calls. She was out about a week after the three days of dead things being displayed to give my dogs her shots. I was telling her about the display dead things and then I said to her, you know, I saw something back in February that I can't explain. I began to tell her about the beast I saw and my wife immediately jumped in to stop me, rolling her eyes telling me to stop this ridiculous story. The vet said, quote, no, tell me what did you see, end quote. I told her and she didn't laugh. She actually took it very serious and said, well, you're not going to believe this, but I have a customer whose property borders the riding stables there. She told me she saw a horse wandering the trails one night. She was concerned because there shouldn't be a rideless horse out on those trails at dusk. So she got her binoculars for a closer look and said it wasn't a horse. It was a massive coyote the size of a horse. She was quite shaken. My wife had nothing to say. There was a moment of silence that we then we carried on with our business. I installed a dash cam after that but haven't had any further sightings. Dead things left on display or coyote killings but I never did find the head of that deer and I did look. And I've never figured out what could walk to the middle of the swamp area to get that crane nest. But found but wound Sorry, but wound then not eat the chicks, but carry them about a thousand yards away and display them in a perfect row, dead center in the middle of my trail entrance after doing the same two nights prior with a muskrat and a turkey. I will add that my daughter noted something strange in the swamp. The cattails were matted down in a perfect circle, about 30 feet in diameter. This is getting frickin' bizarre. They were not matted down haphazardly, but in a crop circle fashion, all laying flattened out in a perfect spiral, like a spinning disc, 30 feet in diameter, had gently hovered and then lowered to the ground, causing a perfect spiral about 30 feet in diameter in a perfect circle. When she pointed out that out, I had no explanation. The reeds and cattails next to the spiral weren't perfectly wrecked. I thought maybe a whirlwind set down there, but if it did it, if it did, it didn't seem to do any other damage. End of email. And there you go. Another bizarre frickin' experience. What do you say to that? There's been a lot of the large dog things, right? Well, this is going to be interesting, I think. But thanks for sending that in, man. I appreciate it. And uh, if you've had anything else like that happen since, you might want to s share with us, all right? I have, I remember there is, I remember I've read a couple stories of hunters um, harvesting a buck, deer, taking all the meat, leaving the head and the spine and the hide in the woods and then coming home and it was balled up on their porch at their house miles away from where they harvested it. What's up with that, right? There's also some I believe there's a man who sent me a book. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, unfortunately. And he's been researching these beings, and he had the exact same sounds he made blasted back at him when he got home, dozens of miles away from his research area. And it was spoken to him the second he got out of his vehicle at his house. Right? There's some crazy shit going on. Some crazy shit. Uh, before you get going, there's something else I forgot to mention. Now, one of my... And I, the drone thing, the drone's nothing new. I think I'm on my fifth drone, <laughs> okay? I've been droning since they first came out. I just haven't had time to do it, and I really want to. And I finally started doing it again lately. So, there is a... I intentionally stopped at one spot along the Birkenhead River to drone an area. I'll show it to you right now. So, this is called Spetch Creek. There's a Forest Service road there that's called Spetch Creek. And this chunk of mountain... These mountains are in between the Birkenhead River and Joffrey, Joffrey Lakes, all right? 
This is probably one of the most hottest areas for sightings that I am familiar with, one of them. And there's a couple, a couple that disappeared. And here's the photo here. And this couple parked their vehicle right down below there and they hiked up into that area, into that timber, and imagining that flattened out area in the center. And they disappeared. They didn't find their backpacks, they didn't find anything. Dave Plyus investigated this thoroughly, spoke to their families, and agrees, says, something's quite odd with this case. It's never been solved and nobody's ever found a sign of them, ever. Now one thing I was wondering at first that I, I was wondering because in the beginning after they went missing, I think I was up north, I remember sitting on this mountainside looking along this rock face a few hundred yards ahead of me. And this rock face was probably about 150 meters long by about 40 feet deep and then it was just, you know, sloping, spill off, crumbling gravel. Well, and I would never have thought twice about walking along the top of that gravel at the base of that face ever. I've probably done it a few times, actually I have. But while we're sitting there on the top, we we're sheep hunting, a whole length, the whole length of that rock face folded off and crumbled down below. It scared the living shit out of me. Because if you were on that trail, you would have been rock piled and never, ever, ever found unless they had cadaver dogs running around in that rock pile if they decided it looked fresh. So, and I, I even spoke to Dave a few times about this case too, and I said that I think that maybe there's a possibility they got rock piled because I never thought about getting rock piled much before until I saw that happen in the woods myself. And I always thought that, well, there's a pretty good chance they may have got rock piled. But now that I look at those drone shots and I look in those granite mountains and those rolling smooth and off faces and hips, I don't think they got rock piled. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can see what I'm looking at. But anyways, I thought I'd share that. That is where that couple has went absolutely missing, right there. Now, what have we got? Okay, listen to this. I just read the first two sentences a second ago. Titled North Van, so it's North Vancouver. Hi Steve, we've never met, but you might know me as the guy that started the Sasquatch poll on the HuntingBC.ca forum several years back. I'm also a supporter of Dave Plyas and all the work he is doing with the Missing Can-Am Project. I may send the story to him as well. Feel free to use my name. I've reached a point in my life where I really don't care what people think about me. Well, how funny is that? You're actually the guy that started that thread, because I brought that thread up a few times on this channel. And obviously you remember that I was probably the, uh, the loudest voice in that thread, right? <laughs> Do you remember that? Remember that douche that called himself Bowie Boy, I believe it was, back then? I use him as an example quite often of how it's so bizarre to watch people just want people to shut up. And there was him and maybe a couple others, not too many though, and that thread is a popular thread and a lot of brave people came forward in that thread and there's that handful of guys that were just determined to keep trying to humiliate every single person that spoke and every time I made a post that guy would try to jump on me, right? Remember that? And then I'm and then I decided, oh I'll be getting the last word in. <laughs> and I did. I believe I did, didn't I? But anyway, welcome aboard. Let's hear your story. Sorry for that little interruption. Now First off, I want to thank you for everything you're doing for all of us at Venture Into the Woods. The forest is a place of immense beauty. It also has the ability to humble us in a good way by making us realize that we are, as individuals, small in the grand scheme of things. I started hunting approximately 12 years ago. This is why I like to hunt alone most of the time. It gives me a chance to get away from the lower mainland area where I live, which is getting more and more dense and more and more inundated with the trappings of inflated egos. I like to add that when I hunt solo, I always carry a Garmin InReach Explorer, InReach Explorer that has the ability to text and send an SOS signal to emergency services. I also carry bear spray in any area populated by grizzlies. I've always been a calm, even-keeled person. I grew up as a teenager playing in a band in front of large audiences. I rock climbed, whitewater kayaked, raced motorcycles for four years in the States, and I'm currently 17 years into a career as a firefighter. What I'm trying to say is that I've always handled myself calmly in intense firefighting situations. 
The occurrence I wanted to share with you took place approximately 25 years ago when I was around 21 years old. To date, I've only shared this with my wife and three of my closest friends, but I feel that this may help others realize that they are not alone with their own unsettling experiences. And here it goes. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I started learning meditation along with another friend of mine at the time. I found there was a great way to feel a deeper connection with myself as well as a deeper sense of calm. I also started to notice that the sixth sense that you often mention started to increase as I became better at meditation. It makes sense when I think about it. Meditation helps quiet the often ever-present chatter of the ego in the mind. When that chatter is quieted and we are less focused inwardly, we are suddenly able to more be more aware of and focus on the stimuli from our surroundings that our sixth sense is able to pick up on. The chatter of the ego distracts us from these subtle and sometimes not so subtle energies and stimuli. Maybe there's more to it than that, but that theory makes sense to me. During this time I had numerous strange occurrences that were odd, but nothing as frightening as what happened to me one summer day in the forest behind my house. My parents had bought a a plot of land up on the side of the North Shore Mountains. Cleared it and built a house. Beyond our property was nothing but the forest. There was no further development behind us. I was living with them at the time and liked to hike and explore out into the forested mountain literally from the back door of the house. I've always wondered if there's monster blacktails up there when I look up there. I bet you there is. One summer day I hiked out into the woods and decided to hike uphill and scramble up a short bluff that I'd been been to a couple of times before. It was sunny, the birds were chirping, and the forest felt warm and welcoming. Previously I had only sat on the top of the bluff taking in the sun and enjoying the view of the city. This time, however, I decided to hike beyond the tree line into the forest that continued uphill at the back of the top of the little bluff. As soon as I stepped through the trees and took several steps in, I noticed that there were no normal forest sounds. The birds had gone completely silent, and there were no buzzing sounds of insects. It was a silence that felt uncomfortable. The forest seemed dark and somehow lifeless. It was also much cooler. The hairs stood up on the back of my neck, and I thought to myself, Suck it up, princess. And I kept pushing further in and up. I suddenly noticed that I was no longer hiking in a relaxed manner. I was walking carefully and quietly as if instinctually trying to not disturb something that a part of me knew was somewhere nearby. I felt like this area of forest was devoid of life. Again, I ignored this feeling and kept going. Further up the hill, I came across a short stump that had some melt melted candles on it. It was a strange thing to find out there, and to this day I'm not sure of its relevance to what happened next. Nearby, there was an old burnt-out lower half of a tree. It stood around eight feet tall and was almost completely burnt through at its base, and I knew it wouldn't take much to topple it. I was still feeling, feeling uneasy by my surroundings, but the kid in me thought that maybe pushing it and watching it bump and roll down the hill would break the tension and create a feeling of levity. I gave the tree a quick push, and it snapped off at the base and crashed to the ground and continued to crash down the hill with a great volume. The loud crashing felt like, it, felt like an intrusion to the previous unnatural quiet. All of a sudden I felt a cold tingling on the back of my neck and a wave of fear. I felt like I was in great danger. It was like the still air of the forest was suddenly abuzz with a threatening energy. It felt like I had really pissed something off. I ran. I ran downhill fast. I could see the opening in the tree line further downhill that would lead back to the top of the bluff like it was a door to safety. As I was running, as quickly as I could, over the uneven ground, and all the while feeling that there was something running right behind me, chasing after me, I could, quote, see, end quote, it in my mind's eye. So I quickly stole a glance back and saw nothing, but I knew it was there right behind me. I was terrified. I made it to the bluff, quickly scrambled down it, and continued through the lower section of the woods back to my house. At the back of my house was a glass sliding door that I went through into the safety of the house. I caught my breath and nervously chuckled at what had just happened. I remember trying to brush it off because accepting that it was accepting that it as real was too unnerving. 
unfortunately it didn't stop there. I was a bit of a night owl at the time and I usually stayed up well past my folks until midnight or 1 a.m. The glass sliding door that I'd come in that day entered into the dining room that was next to the kitchen. So at night I would often come up from my room which was on the floor below and walk past the glass sliding door. Walk into the kitchen to have a bite and then walk past it again on my way back down to my room. However, after my experience in the woods, I felt the same feeling of fear whenever I walked by the glass door at night. I could sense that there was some thing standing on the other side of the glass watching me. This thing was not friendly. That sucks. This continued on for at least a week. Then it was no longer at the back door looking in. It had moved. I started to get that same feeling while walking past the doorway of our den. Whenever I walked through the den that was next to my bedroom downstairs, it was no longer outside looking in. It was in. I avoided that room, especially at night. I felt the same threatening energy coming from it, especially from the small alcove in the back, <coughs> excuse me, in the back corner. I even called my buddy to come and check out the room, and he did. And he said he felt very uneasy and threatened in there. This is creepier than shit. Then one night my parents and my brother were up at the dining room table and I decided to head up to my head up from my bedroom to join them. I stepped out of my bedroom and immediately saw some strange movement out of the corner of my eye. It was as if visual image. It was as if visual visual image of the den itself past the doorway was warping or wobbling. It was like I was looking through some sort of visual distortion. Then, as I quickly turned to look fully at it, the visual anomaly seemed to quickly shrink or compress into an orb shape that was glowing, a muted gray color and approximately the size of a volleyball. I was only able to catch a glimpse of the orb as it quickly moved behind the corner of the wall out of sight. This sounds familiar, and if I did read this it was a long time ago, but this is creepy. I ran like hell up the stairs and stopped facing my family at the dinner table. I'll never forget my mother saying, Are you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. And I said, I think I just did. I attempted to tell them what I'd just seen, but my brother just scoffed at me, and my parents quickly brushed off the incident. Well, I'd had enough. My buddy suggested that we call an older friend of ours that we considered a bit more of a, a mentor, as he had been practicing meditation for much longer than us, and he often hosted group meditations, a couple of which we had attended. He suggested I quote, clean, end quote, the room with some, burning, with some burning sage, while kindly repeating that it was not welcome here and should leave and go elsewhere. Now, normally, even though I am a status First Nation member, I would have laughed at the thought of doing such a thing, but I was desperate, so I did it. Well, I don't know exactly what to make of it, but it worked. I didn't have any issues in that house after that. I didn't, however, ever go back after that one area woods again. I didn't want to push my luck. I also stopped doing meditation not long after that. I've since come to regret stopping and have recently started to practice it again. I think it's important to order to hone that sixth sense. Sorry, I think it's important in order to hone that sixth sense. Being someone that hunts solo most of the time, I believe that having a keen sixth sense might keep me from getting into a bad situation especially after watching Missing 4 and one The Hunted. Anyway, I hope that my experience can somehow help someone, somehow. I know this is not about Sasquatch, but I think there are many things out there that are, that we don't fully understand. Thanks again, Dorian Bueller. Dorian, thank you, man. I think I may have read that, and if I did, well, I'm glad I read it again. And I have a feeling well, I'm convinced. I'm not going to dictate it to any of you. You'll figure it out for yourselves. But I am absolutely convinced the orb, the lights, the ball of lights, and these beings are absolutely connected without a doubt. All right? Without a doubt. Um, in your backyard, um, probably 15 years ago, uh, Region 2 Wildlife Biologists told me flat out they had enough fur samples from grizzly bears to identify 54 different grizzly bears back then. In a triangle between Squamish, a line from Squamish to Whistler, North Van, and back to Squamish. I know that. It's a pass on to you. And also, um, these, 
Whistler uh, Search and Rescue volunteers, a couple of their members have, have found um, Sasquatch prints numerous times, and they were looking for a man who had, there's apparently, there's a trail, I'm not familiar with it, a hiking trail from Squamish that goes up top there, whoosh, all the way to you guys in North Band somewhere, some trail there. And they were looking for that guy on the trail. They apparently found him. He committed suicide, unfortunately. But while they were looking for him, they found a massive print and sent me the photo of that, too. i got to still have it somewhere. But they found a Sasquatch print right up there as well. So, there you go. I'm not quite sure you realize that there are tons of sightings in all those mountains overlooking Vancouver. Everywhere. Seashell, Gambier Island. A friend of mine sent me a photo. They found motocrossing in the spring. I've posted that picture on here numerous times. They found prints on Gambier. Prints in the snow. And they felt uneasy and shitting themselves while they were there. So there you go. It's anywhere. It's everywhere and anywhere at any time, right? These things are happening. And we need to speak out loud. And share it, right? And I'm glad that we share it. I'm glad I, I'm glad I watched Stephen Greer today. And I'll, if I can, and think of it, I'll forward that link to his video and this video in the description below, I guess. Hopefully I remember to. Excuse me. Anyway, uh, this past weekend, my dear friend is a, uh, he's the big cheese of the Whistler Fire Department. Also having some very unfortunate luck with the family. And uh, as we're chatting away, we're talking about various funny stories when we got some alone time BS and telling stories and he was he's saying how he always tells the crew, their first responders and I'm going to pass this on to all of you, I think it's valuable he says always remember your ABC's ABC's they always say it to each other all the time, ABC's remember your ABC's always be calm